for young people. I saw his heart for our church, his heart for ministry. And uh, we, we served together I, I, several years. How long was it? How long were you here? Three? And uh, just, just a, a wonderful man. We're, we're so honored to be able to have him back. Now he's living up near Charlottesville area, Crozier. Is that right? Did I say that correct? Yeah. Uh, somewhere in that ballpark anyway. We were near there yesterday. <laughs> Living in that area, serving as an associate pastor, something on those lines. I'll let him uh, talk a little more if he wants. But we're just blessed to have him here today with us to be a, a small part again of remembering our past and our heritage. And uh, if you would, would you stand to your feet and clap your hands and make welcome back to the Fairlawn Church of God pulpit and platform, the Honorable Reverend David Bartholomew Webb. God bless him. can't believe he gave me the golden mic. The last time I had my hands on it, you were in a panic. It was broke, and there was something, and I was like, give me that thing. Let me, let me try to, you know, oh, don't touch it, don't touch it. You're going to make it worse. I, I don't think I've ever got to hold the golden mic. You're lightening up, Marcus. That's good. Um, it is very, very wonderful to be back. Um, very, so, so many familiar faces, some new, and that's a great thing. So some of you that have no idea who I am, that's a wonderful thing. Um, that means that you've grown and there's new people. Um, but so many of you, it, it's funny, you know, we, we drove up and, and the kids immediately, you know, we, we, we spent quite a few years in that house right on this property. That was, that was home. Uh, this was home. And we, we shared meals together. We Watch some of your kids get married together. We cried and mourned together as those who went and passed on. We shared life together and became family. And that's how we view Fairlawn Church of God. You are part of our family. You are part of what we did here. Um, and there's many times I don't know what I did here. I know I broke a lot of stuff. Um, uh, but you ever just kind of look back? I don't. It's weird in ministry. One of the main things that I know a lot of ministers, I know I do, I always just feel like I'm such a failure. I never feel like I've done anything worthwhile. And uh, ran into Philip Butcher the other day. He's pastoring now, and he was he was just a, a college student at the time, and 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 he helped me out. He brought Amy, and he was Amy's one, and he was just talking about all these great things. You remember when we did this at Fairlawn, you know? And it was just in that moment where I had felt like I had done nothing in my life, and it was like okay. Well, at least there's something. I was at least part of that, and and uh, and it's wonderful. Some of you, I, I, we keep in touch on on Facebook, and and I know it's such a wonderful you. And you know, when you have people that pray for you and care about you, and 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 know that we do the same for you. And it's funny, Marcus and I don't don't talk all the time. We see each other at state events and those kind of things. But it's you know your friends and those true friendships when you get together and you just kind of fall right back to exactly where you were. And and uh, there were many days I I just spent my hours in Marcus's office eating his candy. <laughs> he, he always had uh, Jolly Ranchers, and I would just sit on his very decorated office and animal couch and think, what in the world is wrong with him? Uh, but it is. It's, it's good to be here, and it's wonderful to be with you this morning. Uh, I want to I want to talk to you, and it is, it is homecoming, so I want to talk about coming home. And so this will be a very familiar passage, a very familiar story to, to many of you um, that I want to share. I remember one of the greatest compliments I ever had here was uh, by Brother Jack, and he used to say, Brother Dave, we love when you speak because we just never know what you're going to say. <laughs> I don't know if he was meaning it as an insult, but I took it as a compliment, like, so maybe we'll get into some mischief this morning. I don't, I don't know. But this would be a very familiar uh, passage of Scripture. I'm going to look at uh, three different parables that Jesus, and he, he's kind of given us this image of who God is. And I don't know about you. I, I tend to pay attention when Jesus is talking about who God is. Uh, not, not to say that <laughs> you need to read all the Scripture, but when Jesus started to speak and share, it's kind of important. <laughs> We need to pay attention. So I'm going to look at that this morning. And, uh, and uh, what I really love about this church is the fellowship hall is not connected. I preached a homecoming a few years ago, and I was about 10 minutes in, and you could just smell the chicken <laughs> coming up. Yeah, but I, just had to, I just had to finish. No one cared what I was saying. They wanted to go eat. So I'll try to 
Jennifer usually gives me a signal like, all right, you need to, you need to end it. It's time to go eat. So, um, but there's a quote, Blaise Pascal, he, he was this guy and he, he always had these great quotes. And he said, God created people in his image on the sixth day and every day since people have returned the favor. And we have entered a time, and it's nothing new, that we are beginning to kind of come up with our own image of who God is. And it's important to look, who did Jesus say that God was? And, and Jesus he would use parables. And it's true, we will say these sayings, man, Jesus spoke in parables, but he also, he just spoke to the common man, and he would talk about things that they could understand. And that is true, there's truth to that. But there are some times in his parables, even though he reveals, there's some things that he also would, it's concealed in there. Like he, he would hide things in there to even where the disciples didn't know what he was talking about. And he would do things in such a way that I don't think you could get away with that today. He would say things, you know, like, hey, if you have ears, go ahead and hear. It's kind of like, hey, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. See ya. You know, I, I imagine what, what would that look like if Pastor Marcus got up and told you a riddle and said, all right, see ya, and walked off the stage. Like, what? What is that? So when he would tell these parables, people would listen and they would hear it, but they didn't always necessarily understand exactly what he was saying. And we, we have the luxury, we have the whole narrative, and we've had years and years to study and look back and say, he was trying to show us who God was. And if we just look at the scriptures, we could get an idea of who God is. If you'll turn your, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. And a lot of times when Jesus would tell these parables, Usually in his parable, there's somebody that doesn't necessarily look too good in the story. I don't know about you. I read these parables, and I hardly ever identify with the person that Jesus is talking about. I always want to be the person that's looked down in a good light. The reality is, a lot of times, if we're really being honest and we put ourselves in the parable, we usually are some of those people that Jesus was saying, you just don't have it figured out yet. Uh, that's hard to do. Um, and he does that in these parables. They were kind of scandalous, the way he tells a story. And, and there's this idea, and it kept coming up over and over again in the New Testament. One of the things that, that the Pharisees just couldn't stand is that Jesus was constantly fellowshipping and having dinner with and hanging out with those who were considered sinners and people of ill repute and people that were not accepted, people on the fringe. And this comes up over and over again. And in Luke chapter 15, that's what this whole chapter is about. These parables are about because the Pharisees are upset, once again, that Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. And they just don't think that a holy man should be doing this. And when you kind of get into the culture, uh, Kenneth Bailey wrote this great book, called uh, Poets and Peasants. And he really dives into that, that culture of not only that day, but even just that Mediterranean Eastern culture of what things meant. And to have dinner, to have fellowship with someone else, to sit down and look them face in the face was such a way in their culture to show someone dignity, to dignify them as a human being, to say that I accept you. It, it, we do that kind of but we don't do it like they do in their culture, that that was a big deal, and that's why they were so upset. He was basically saying, I, I see you as a person. I understand that no one else accepts you. I accept you as a person. And, and it's a great book. If, if you ever read his book, you'll be reading and say, man, this guy says it way better than Pastor Dave did. Uh, I encourage you. It's called Poet and Peasant. Now, I'll, I'll be using some of the stuff that he wrote today because tax collectors, they were so despised because these, these were people, not, they weren't just taking their money they were considered to go against their whole ethnicity, that they were working for the Roman government. They were Jews who were working for the Roman government, taking money from the Jews. They were just looked at, and, and you gotta remember that the way that they looked at forgiveness was that if you were to steal something from somebody, you had to go, according to temple law, go repay that seven times. You had to figure out how much you owed them, then pay them more. So it was viewed that tax collectors had robbed people so much that they could never fully be forgiven because they could never fully repay it. And that's just how their minds thought. You can't even live up to the temple law. You can never be forgiven. You're going to hell. There's no hope for you. And the fact that Jesus is having dinner with tax collectors, he didn't even just go to their house. He invited them to where they were at. This is a big problem. So if you look at Luke 15, this is how it starts out. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
Then Jesus told this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And bring over the banana pudding. That's just how I hear it in my head. I'm sorry. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then we get to point, I'm going to spend probably more time on this part. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arm around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what, is, what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father, said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Bow your heads very quickly. Lord, we thank you that we have this beautiful image of who you are, that you are a God that seeks after lost things. And from a personal standpoint, from someone who was lost and needed to be found, I am only here because you sought after lost things. Lord, we celebrate that this morning. And Lord, we ask that your word just speak to us and move us, not just today, but through this week also. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Okay, these are three very scandalous stories. And the first parable for many of us where he starts out, we could kind of just read that and kind of get the gist of that. But you have to understand, at this point in time, in Jesus' day, to be a shepherd was looked so down upon. And again, that's weird for us because we could read throughout the history of the Bible. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. But at this time, the way that the Pharisees had begun to set up all these rules and regulations, shepherds were ceremonially unclean. They were not allowed in the temple because all the things they had to deal with. So when Jesus, right off the bat, says, so let's say you're a shepherd, you could just imagine the Pharisees, oh, not me. Because a good Jewish home was not going to have someone in their family become a shepherd. It was just looked down upon. It was just a dirty job that you just wouldn't do. Not, not if you're a good, upstanding, religious Jew that wanted to be holy and take part in the temple and all those things. 
But that's how Jesus starts off this parable. It's kind of like a, a shot to the jaw right at the get-go. And you wonder why they wanted to kill him, right? He was constantly just meddling. And the way that he would phrase these stories, they meant a little bit more when you really get into some of the culture and, and what it meant. And he tells this story about this sheep being lost. And if you ever talk, I had to research this. The thing about sheep is when they are lost and they finally realize they're lost, they kind of just get paralyzed. And they'll just stop wherever they're at and they'll lay down. And eventually, if no one finds them, they'll die or an animal will kill them. Something will come along with it. That, that's it. They just give up. And so it's this idea of the shepherd, I have to find this one that's lost because it will die if I don't go find it. It is lost. He had 99 that were okay. And he goes after the one. He, and here's the thing. In this parable, we get this idea, we get this image of God seeking after something that's lost. The shepherd has to go find it that sheep just aren't smart enough to find their own way home. I have a dog, I can, I can let my dog out and he'll roam around. He eventually comes home. He can smell his way back. There probably have been a few times I was like, good riddance, but he always comes back. <laughs> I take that back. I love that dog. My kids are like, he's lying up there. I, I do, I love that dog. I would be heartbroken. Sheep aren't like that. And, and my dog's not even that smart, but he's smart enough to come home a sheep would just lay down. It would get so overcome with fear and realizing that it's lost from the pack, it would just get paralyzed and do nothing. It can't make its own way home. And I think sometimes we just, we develop this mentality, especially in our culture. We're very individualistic, I can't say this word anymore, individualistic culture, which is a good thing. It's not necessarily always a bad thing. That's kind of how we were formed, how our country started, that we believe you should be able to do things on your own. But sometimes that enters in our mind, even with those who are lost, that we just think, well, they just need to find their way back. And the Pharisees are kind of that, the same way. And Jesus is saying, I'm giving you an image of God that goes after something that doesn't even know how to find its way back. And he goes right into the next parable with a lost coin. And you see this image of this woman who, who apparently her wife is so domesticated that she knows her coin has to be in the house. It can't be down at the market. It's in the house. And she, she, she searches all over, and she finds it, and she rejoices. And again, a coin isn't even a living thing. There's, there's no way any coin can ever help itself to be found. Someone has to go searching for that. So we get this image of God going searching for things that are lost. And we also get this image that, man, the, the, the first one, the shepherd, he is willing. It says that he rejoices when he finds it, not even when he has it home. He re, and knowing that he has to pick that sheep up and carry it home, he still rejoices. It doesn't matter that I have to put this burden on my shoulders. Th let's rejoice about this. And we get this image of the community rejoicing with them, the shepherd getting together with the other shepherds. I found my lost sheep. This woman calling her friends, hey, rejoice with me. I have found what was lost. So when something lost is found, it's not just for us to share as individuals. It's us to share as a community, as a body. And it's a wonderful thing. And we get into the third parable. And I'll probably spend a little bit more time here. And we often call this story the story of the prodigal son. And that might even be above that little section of your Bible. I promise you that is not Holy Spirit inspired. Some man put that there, that, that this does not have to be the prodigal son. In fact, if you're going to label it, it probably needs to be called two lost sons because the other son was absolutely as lost as the first one. And we'll get into that in a minute. But we always call it that. And I'm trying to train my brain. In fact, Jennifer said, what are you going to speak? I was like, ah, oh, the prodigal. Ah, I told myself I'm not calling that anymore. So if you do, don't, don't feel bad. <laughs> but it's not accurate. And we see the son, he says this man had two sons, and the younger one says to his father, give me my share of the estate. He's basically saying, Dad, I don't want to wait till you're dead. In fact, I wish you were dead now. I just want what's coming to me. That's basically in that culture what he's saying. Dad, I wish you were dead. And when you look at this culture and the way that it was set up, this, this very act is unthinkable. When these people hear this, they probably would have gasped <gasps> because that just wasn't, that, that thing didn't happen to them. They lived in a very patriarchal 
setup that what the father said was what the father said, and everyone just kind of followed along. And for a son to do this was unheard of. It's still unheard of in that culture. So all of this crowd has to be shocked by this story. Like, who? why would this son do this? And I've always read this story thinking that, I mean, this guy was so rich that he could just give it. But it doesn't say that. So to give half of what he had to his son to let him go it could have hurt him financially. He still had to, to make that back up. But he does it. And we have to, he has to know that this young son... He hasn't had a Dave Ramsey course. He hasn't studied anything like that. He's not going to know how to save his money. He has to know he's going to go spend this money and waste this money. And we also get this image of God that if you absolutely want to make choices to ruin your life and you are adamant about it, the Father will let you. Man, that's, that's hard sometimes to swallow, that if you are just adamant about doing your own thing, we see that the Father says that, that if that's really what you want, I would rather you not do that, but if that's what you want. And God allows us to make bad decisions. He does. Carrie. <laughs> Sorry, Craig. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Sorry. This is going to bring shame to his father's house. And, and, and again, when you, you really look at that culture, it's not so much for us, but to, to lose your honor was such a big deal. And this, this brings dishonor on his father's house. It was embarrassing. The whole community would know he's turning his back, just not on his family, but on the village too, on the whole, his whole way of life, everything that he had ever been taught, he's walking away from, and he's leaving in dishonor, and he's embarrassed his father. He's shamed his father. And it says not long after that, he got all together he had, and he went to a distant country, and he squandered his wealth in wild living. He left his family, his culture, his religion behind. And after he spent everything, there's a famine that comes along, and all of a sudden he's in need, and he has to hire himself out to the point that he hires himself out to a pig farmer. And again, maybe that doesn't register to us right away, but the Jewish culture would have nothing to do with pigs, he's basically saying, everything I was ever taught or believed in, I don't care about. He has totally abandoned home. He has turned so far from his upbringing and religion that he's willing to work with pigs. And all of a sudden it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. I've read where several theologians aren't really convinced that that was true repentance at that time, that he was just hungry and wanting to go back. And we really don't know for sure. I can only go to my own experience. I haven't been in that situation, but I've been and maybe many of you have too, where you come to your senses and the life that you're living is not the life you're supposed to be living. And I can remember just trying to figure out how in the world can I get back to where I was? And when I read this, I feel that in here that maybe he wasn't totally repentant, but I feel like he was desperate enough to say, I will do anything to get back into the good graces of my father. He said, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and f was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. We get this image of the father waiting for him this whole time. And as soon as he sees his son, he runs to him. And this is extremely significant because not just in this culture, even in any culture, gentlemen, noblemen do not run, but especially back then, it was considered disgrace for a nobleman to run. Uh, and here we see this father willing to take on indignity of himself, of running to his son that he did not care. He has rejected his father. He's rejected the village. He's rejected a whole way of life. And now he's come back and he's going to have to face all these. Just imagine it's just knowing I'm coming to the edge of town. People are going to see me. What are they going to say? Are they going to throw stuff at me? Are they going to mock me? And yet instead of meeting that, he meets his father because his father runs 
all the way to him. How can he deal with this? Um, the only way that this is not going to be a terrible day and terrible spectacle for him is if you have a father who is willing to do something even more humiliating than what you have done. Unless you have a father who was willing to humiliate himself. Because if you think it was a spectacle or a scandal to see this kid coming home with his hat in his hand, it was even more of a spectacle to see the father run to his son. This rich nobleman doing the one thing that rich noblemen do not do. And he makes a fool of himself. See, this tradition goes all the way back to Aristotle. It's been passed down. You could even hear it in the song of Brother Sting. You remember that in the 80s with his classic Englishman in New York? A gentleman walks but never runs. Go ahead. You could, you could look it up. It's there. <laughs> the point is that this was unexpected. And now you have this village. Instead of seeing this kid come home going and mocking him, they see this guy that's been respected, this rich nobleman. Like, did, did you just see him run in his robe? What in the world is he doing? And he meets his son on the edge of town where there's no one to glare at him or jeer at him. The first one to meet him is the father, and the first experience of coming home is one of grace and mercy and love. So the scandal is now not on the son and people saying, can you believe he had the nerve to come back? Now it's on the father. Can you believe he ran like that? He's lost his mind. Instead of allowing his son to face disgrace, he dives right into it himself, and he humbles himself. And this comes to fruition. We read this in Philippians 2.8. Jesus did the same thing, and being found in appearance a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross, that we have a Savior who was willing to humiliate himself for us so that the, the spotlight is not on us, it's on him. And Jesus is showing the Pharisees, this is who God the Father is. This is why I dine with people that you would not with, because I see value in them even when you don't. And he throws his arms around his son instead of the son having to bow down and kiss his father's feet and beg for forgiveness. It says that he kisses him. And the verb there paints this picture of him showering his son with kisses all over. And it's in these moments, I've been there, I don't know if you ever have, where you come back and you have this moment of repentance and you're trying to make things right, that God lavishes his love on you, that just breaks you to the point that you can't even utter words. Man, and I go back to those moments in my own life when I'm beginning to get judgmental or things like that of remembering there were times where I just had to stand in the moment of God lavishing his love on me. That's where breakthrough happens. And the main point of all these parables in Luke 15 is finding what is lost, the sheep, the coin, and even the son. And we say, yeah, but he headed home. He made a movement towards home. The father had to go to him. The father did run to him, but he had to head home. And, and we don't realize the effort is still all on the father. You know, we always want to have these sayings, you know, well, brother, if, if you just take two steps towards God, he'll take two steps towards you. I don't know why I use that accent. <laughs> just felt right. <laughs> um, not that I have any problem with that. It just felt like that's how uh, I probably heard it in a sermon somewhere just like that. <laughs> um, that wasn't meant to uh, sound like anybody in particular that I know of. I think that just came out. We have this idea that, man, if we could just meet God halfway, I want to let you in on a little secret. You never meet God halfway. It's too far to go. You can't do it. He is always coming further than us. Always. That the idea of grace is, you can't even comprehend it. When we, when we read some of other Jesus' parables and stories, and he talks about, the man who owned the vineyard, and he's hiring workers later and later in the day. And we tend to read that story thinking that we're the people that were working all day long. I've got news for you. We all came at the last hour. We all needed enough grace that would cover that much. 
I'm a grace guy. I, it probably comes because I've dealt with teenagers most of my ministry, and they need a lot of grace. And if you're a youth pastor, you definitely need a lot of grace. Because there's sometimes thoughts, maybe even words that you say that <laughs> they go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. But the idea of grace, I think sometimes we think we can just kind of put it in a bottle and realize what the limit is. There is no limit on that. That God's grace, at least in my life, is far more abundant than I can possibly, possibly fathom. And I'm only standing here because of God's grace. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. Dead people cannot engineer their own resurrection unless you are Jesus, and we are not. And this goes against a lot of our upbringing. Man, if you just pick yourself up by the bootstraps, and again, I, I've said that. I, I believe in that saying to an extent. But have you ever been around a, a family member, maybe it was yourself, that when it came to this, this sinful man that we are, that it was only by the grace of God and the movement of the Holy Spirit drawing them to Christ that brought them up. It was nothing they can do on their own, but we've seen it and we rejoice in that when all of a sudden they are a changed person and maybe they didn't even change all at once, but we could tell something is different in them that this time God got a hold of their heart. They want to live different. They want to change. They didn't do that on their own. The Holy Spirit drew them unto Christ and he did that for them. The one thing he did have to do, he had to swallow his pride. He had to stop running and allow his father to love him. Sometimes we have to stop running and be okay with the fact that we have to be dependent on the father. The son says to the father, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And remember, he was going to say, let me be like one of your hired servants. He never gets to say that. His father cuts him off and says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. The son never gets to utter those eight words. He never gets to say, make me like one of your hired men. He had to accept the fact that he was accepted. And there's so many times we feel like we have to prove our worth. And the father says, put the robe on him. Put the best robe on him. You know what the best robe was? The father's robe. So now when he walks around the village, whether the village people like it or not, there's nothing they can say because now it says, I am covered by the robe of my father. And he said, put sandals on his feet. Servants didn't get to wear sandals. So now he's walking around. This is someone who is part of of the family. He's not a hired servant. This is my son. And he walks around. He has the ring on. With He has my robe. He's covered. And he has my authority. He's part of the family. And he says, kill the calf. When you kill the calf, this isn't just for a few people to celebrate. This would feed at least 100 people. His father is saying, we're inviting the whole town. We're having a party. We're going to celebrate. We're having a barbecue. Everyone come on down. <laughs> and the older son walks in. He comes from the field. He's near the house. He hears the music and dancing. And he calls out to the servant, what's going on? He says, your brother's come home. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him safe and sound. And he becomes angry and he refuses to go in. And his father goes out and pleads with him. And he's like, all these years... Dad, I've served you. I've been a slave for you. I've never disobeyed you, and you've never even given me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he doesn't even refer to him as brother, when this son of yours who squandered everything with prostitutes, you kill the fat calf for him. What you have to understand is the oldest son in this culture, when there's a celebration like this, he's supposed to play host. This is the father's way of showing off his oldest, his brightest, the one who's going to inherit the most. This is my oldest son, but he's going to serve you. And the fact that when he hears the music and sees the celebration and knows what's going on, refuses to go in, he shames his father every bit as much as his brother did. Maybe even worse, because the whole village is right there. The fact that the father has to go out and plead with him to come in. It's, this is going on in front of everybody. 
Everybody knows what's going on. And he, even, he doesn't even understand who he is. God, I, Father, I've been a slave for you. He views himself as a, as a slave or a servant instead of part of the family. And there's so many times we see people, man, God, I've done everything for you, and I've never gotten anything. And we see the Father meet the Son with the same kind of grace. Everything I have is yours. Come, come on in. He doesn't banish him and say, well, if that's your attitude, then don't come in. He, no, come, come on. Everything I have is yours. I know you've been with me. So we get this image of these two lost sons, but a father who is gracious to both of them. This father is willing to search after what is lost. His response is loving and gentle to the youngest and the oldest. He extends the same grace and the same mercy. And Jesus was showing the Pharisees that the tax collectors and the other sinners, they were at least able to accept the fact that they were accepted and it was only by mercy and grace. And he's saying, can you do that? Can you accept that your sonship is there, that you are not to live as slaves? And there's sometimes I wonder, can I fully acknowledge how dead I really am? And that it's nothing that I did to grant me eternal life. All I had to do was swallow my pride and accept that I was accepted and accept Jesus as my Savior. And sometimes we just feel if we just have enough zeal, that'll get it done. And the, and the young son kind of had this zeal more in a negative way than a positive way. But zeal is not necessarily a bad thing. We see people that can be really zealous at times. Remember when I was at Lee University, there was kind of like a revival that was going on between some of the students, and it was kind of picking up some momentum, and it was, it was really good. And they were talking to one of the professors there, and they were trying to convince him he needed to come out and check this out. And this professor had been around a long time. He was wise. And in his moment in life, what he was trying to get us to understand was, I don't, I don't need that at this point. And I want you, if that's what you need, Go do that. That's great. But I, I don't, I'm not at that point. I, I'm, I'm okay. He probably just didn't want to come out and hang out with college students. But what he was trying to say is, I, I love your zeal, and if that's what you need to do right now, do that. But in my life, that, that's not what I need from God right now. I'm, he was more in things going on with his family. He was getting in touch with the throne in his own way. And I, at the time, I didn't understand that. I understand it fully now that there are moments in our life where we need different things from God. And it's okay. We don't always understand it when someone's like, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily need that right now. Man, I, I just need to get a hold of the throne. And we don't necessarily understand. And our zeal, sometimes we think, man, if we could just get it done. I remember when I was in the Navy and, and I was at A school and we were in class. We had Army we had uh, Marines, we had Air Force, we were all there together. And there was this Marine, and we, you know, we use this term AJ squared away. He was the epitome of what you would think a Marine should be. I mean, he was squared away. And every answer was allowed, oorah, to where it scared you most of the time. His zeal for being a Marine was not to be questioned. But he wasn't very smart. And he couldn't pass the class. All that zeal, not that Marines aren't smart just most of them. I'm just kidding. That's just a Navy joke. <laughs> His zeal did him no good. He was a great guy. He loved being in the Marine Corps, but he could not pass these tests to be a signals analyst. He just couldn't do it, and he had to go do something else. Zeal does not always get it done, and it's not that zeal is a bad thing, but it doesn't always get it all the way done. And sometimes we think, well, maybe it's just commitment. The oldest son represents commitment. I remember in high school where my friends and I were going to, we were going into our senior year, and we had this idea the weight room was going to open up at 6 in the morning during the summer. We were going to get there right when it opened. We were going to impress the coaches and show them how committed we were to be there every day. And we started, I mean, for two or three weeks, man. A friend would pick me up about 5.30, and we would head to the gym and what they did, the coaches weren't there. They had some guy that used to be on our team that played a year at junior college, and he was just there to open the gym, and he would take a nap. 
So I just start realizing I'm going in the afternoon when the coaches are there. Not only can I sleep longer, this is ridiculous. I'm not getting up at 5.30 in the morning anymore. It's not going to do me any good. And my friends would still go in the morning. They would literally come at 5.30 in the morning and beep their horns in our street. They finally stopped when my mom ran out and told them to stop. Get out of here. And they were convinced that their commitment of going every morning, that they would be starters and they would be all state. And it didn't happen. We, we were all a little bit stronger. We, we had a good team. But obviously none of us made the NFL. None of us even made all state. But we were committed. They were even more committed than I was. And it didn't get it done. Sometimes we feel the rules will get it done. The Pharisees were like that. They're, they started out, their idea was a great idea, that if we can just have these standards set up, people won't sin. They didn't realize that that's not what gets it done. And it became more of a legalistic thing. That it's like speeding. Okay, we're not supposed to speed. I don't necessarily agree with that rule, but it's a rule. It's a law. And the idea is we don't want you to speed because we want you to be safe, right? That's the, the whole premise behind don't speed. Okay, if I'm driving down the road and my kids, there's an emergency and I'm taking them to the hospital or maybe, you know, someone in your family, they're having a baby, you're going to go faster. And if the policeman pulls you over and sees this and then still says, well, I know I see your emergency, but I'm still going to write you a ticket. Okay, that's defeating the very principle that the law was set up for. That's legalism as, as best as you can kind of see that. And that's what had become in this day that the laws they had set up were to the point it didn't make sense. You're defeating the very purpose of why the law was created. And most of us would not be very happy. We, it would be all over Facebook like that. This guy gave me a ticket and I was on the way to the hospital. That's legalism. Rules do not always get it done. Rules are a good thing. We need rules. We need, we need order. But rules do not always get it done. What does get it done? Love does. And the Father shows us that love is what gets it done. And if I get musicians to play, I'm closing. I was listening to a sermon by Keith Dudley the other day. I don't know if some of you guys, I know you know him. He's been here before. And he was using the scripture from Matthew 22, where Jesus replied to the greatest commandment of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And all the laws of the prophets hang on these. And he reduced it. He said, it's all about love. It's all about loving God and loving others. And, and Keith is a musician, and he used this phrase of staying in the pocket. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that before. Okay. I'm not a musician, so it kind of, I didn't get it. But he talked about the simplicity of staying in the pocket of the basics. He did this really cool thing on the drums uh, that was really cool. I probably didn't understand as much as the musicians did. But his whole idea was if, if we can just be simple enough to realize it's about loving God and it's about loving people because everything hinges on those things. And I can remember in sports, I can relate to that, that it was always whenever things were going bad, they would say, coaches would say, get back to the basics, the fundamentals, the things that you were taught when you were a little kid. Those are things that matter. And the fundamentals and the basics of Christianity, all of it hangs on it. Jesus said, all of it hangs on loving God with everything you have and loving everybody else like you love yourself. Loving God and loving people. We have these moments in humanity when divinity is actually reflected. I was talking about this with Jennifer in the car. We were listening to a book on tape, and it's about this guy being stranded. And I just had these thoughts. They're actually making a movie about it now. Of the, remember the miners that were trapped? And I, I can remember, like, the world stopped. Like, we have these moments when someone is stranded or in trouble, and it becomes this story how we all pull for human life. And we just, we pray that we make it, or we see a tragedy, whether it's a, it's a group of people being shot at their church service, at their prayer meeting. And in that moment, nobody cared 
what type of denomination. All we knew was human life was lost and we were all in prayer for them. That we had these moments of humanity where we, we pull for life and the best of us comes out and where scripture comes to life that we were created in God's image, that his character and his nature is reflected in us when we care for life. And it's amazing how fast we lose that. It doesn't take very long that next thing you know, we want to blame somebody. Man, we get on social media and that very character of God that respected life so much has now turned to anger and we don't really care about life as much as we did a minute ago. How do we stay in the pocket? How do we realize that we were every bit as lost as some of those that, that we're praying for? How do, how do we come home? How do we, how do our loved ones come home? Jesus was trying to show the Pharisees God loves every life, not just the ones that they thought had value. And I struggle. I, I keep hearing Romans 1 come up all the time in the circles I'm in. You know, and it talks about a retrobate mind. He's, all the things going on in our culture today, and, and, and I'm not here to dispute Romans 1. I, I believe everything it says. The problem when you just stop at Romans 1, Paul did not write Romans chapter and verse. He wrote it as a letter. So you can't just stop at Romans 1 because you like what that says. You have to go into Romans 2 and, and read what he said in Romans 2. Because all of a sudden it's almost like we get just all rathered up and it's you guys are the, and it's a us versus them and they're the evil ones and things that they're doing are evil. I, I do not dispute that. Of course, we always forget gossip and some of those things that we struggle with are in there too. But when you go into Romans 2, and when Paul says, therefore, anytime Paul says, therefore, he kind of would write almost like a lawyer. When he'd say, therefore, he's making his point. And in Romans 2, where he says, therefore, you have no excuse. It's almost like we're like, yeah, yeah. It's all you guys. And all of a sudden he says, you have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. And it's like, oh, snap. That's me. When I read that, like, that's me. Because I could be very judgmental many times. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. And what the Pharisees couldn't see, they were so caught up in their judgment of the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they couldn't see. These were lost things that needed to be found. And they were because somebody was loving them. We know, I don't know about you, I struggle with it. Someone asked me what time, well, how often do you sin? At least a couple times a month. I was like, a couple times a month? What time is it now? A couple times this minute. Are you kidding me? Really? Like, yeah, why well, lie about it and add to it? <laughs> try, to, try to make it through the next minute without one. I'm stuck in Matthew 7. I, I'm still trying to remove the plank. I'm, I can't even worry about the speck. I got the plank. You stand your feet. I don't know where everybody's at spiritually. I don't know. Maybe maybe you need to come home. Maybe you, there's there's some things in your life that you just need to make right between you and God. Maybe you know somebody. I guarantee you, we we all know somebody, friend or family. Maybe you just want to come and stand in the gap for them and to realize. First of all, don't give up hope because God goes after the lost things. All those times you're praying, don't stop doing that. It does make a difference. It does matter. And maybe somebody's put some, maybe God's put somebody in your life that you don't even realize the love of Christ that you show to them, those seeds are being planted. The problem is we it just we don't always get to see it in the timing that we want. Phrase we just always hear here. We're a microwave generation serving a crockpot God. I learned that here. I've used that so much because I've loved it. And it's true that we we want it so fast and so now and so many times God's saying, just plant the seeds and let me reap the harvest. Just keep loving on those people, whether they're people you work with, whether they're friends and family. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, I know that there are things that I need to have right with you. 
this season of my life where there's sometimes I doubt and I question. And in my whole life, I, I've acted like both sons. And right now I, I feel like I'm, I'm more like the older son and I'm, I'm just not really seeing what you have for me. Lord, forgive me of that. And Lord, maybe there's some here and they've been worried about a friend or a family member. God, do you know how lost they are? Lord, reassure them through this message, through this parable, that you care about lost things, that you seek after lost things. Or maybe someone here today is lost in the sense that we would see it in this parable, that they don't know you like they used to, and they need to make that right. I pray for them this morning.